good to see you this morning. And just as we are gathering for our hour of worship this Sunday morning, we're going to sing. Did you do this one last week, Richard? Did you introduce this one to them? No, you didn't? Oh, that's good. I'm glad I didn't miss out. This is another lovely new song written by a Sovereign Grace, and it simply says, All I have is Christ. So listen as Richard and Amy lead us with it, and if you catch on to the tune, do sing it through with them. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross and i beheld god's love displayed you suffered in my place you bore the wrath reserved for me now all i know is grace Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransomed life in any way you choose. Oh, Father, use my ransomed life in any way you choose. And let my song forever be my only boast is Absolutely love that song. 
And when Richard was saying that's when they were going to introduce, I thought, I'm going to miss it because we're going to do it when I was over in the Grange. But I love it. As I ran my hellbound race and different to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state, state and led me to the cross. Easter's only a matter of a few weeks away. What tremendous words that remind us that it was Christ who death upon the cross that brought our salvation and gave us hope. Absolutely tremendous. We'll be singing that in the coming weeks to get it known a little bit more and more. I had an announcement sheet and I don't know what there it is there. Uh, tonight, we meet again tonight, half past six here. Um, we, we're continuing a little uh, series on looking at Easter. We're going to look at uh, Jesus, the servant king, tonight, uh, the first first part of it. And I hope you will come along. be good to see more of you out uh, on our twice-monthly evening services. And um, the other week, we don't meet, is, is focused on the youth, our young people, uh, which is great. But we come here, we meet here, we come for a, a short act of worship. It's lovely and intimate. Uh, lovely and, 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 and uh, friendly, a cup of tea afterwards, so please come tonight as we, we continue our Easter series and start looking at the Servant King. Tomorrow night is our congregational meeting, which is about uh, proposals to make a few changes here within the, the meeting house, uh, which will all be explained to you and shown to you on the screen uh, tomorrow evening at 8 o'clock. And this is who can come and who can speak and who can vote according to the law of our church. Normally, both communicant members and adherents have the right to attend and speak at members of the congregation meeting, but only communicant members who are voting members may propose or second any resolution and vote thereon. In other words, any of you, if, you, if you're part of this congregation, in any shape or form, you're, you're welcome to come and participate, but it's only if you're a voting member as you may propose or second and cast a vote. I would encourage you all to come uh, tomorrow evening to that meeting. And if you're a voting member, to cast a vote. Because if you don't vote, you can't complain if it didn't go the way you like it. Whatever that may be. So please come tomorrow night just for a short uh, meeting. Wednesday is our prayer meeting at 8. It'd be great again to see more folks come along. I do encourage you to come on a Wednesday night at 8pm as we pray for our congregation, our community, our country and the wider world, 8 o'clock here in the meeting house. And then next Sunday, next Sunday morning, it was quite a bit on next Sunday, but in the morning it's the PW service, our annual PW service. Uh, Mrs. Beth Montgomery is a speaker. She works with Asia Link. Can I say, to start with, for those who are online, who watch it on, on YouTube or get a DVD, it will not be available. There will be no recording next week due to the sensitive nature of the work that Beth will be talking about. So apologies for that. And also it's in your uh, free will offering pack, there is a PW envelope, which helps support the work of PW and support the work of missions uh, through, through our, our church, uh, through a PCI. So please, if you can, dig that out and give generously to the work of, of the PW and of missions. Normally they have a, a soup lunch, which we haven't been able to do because of no hall, and that would be a, a, a great income to help support the work of the church, uh, the wider work of the church. So that's not available. Please, if you can, give generously through the PW envelope. And then we advance notice for men. Uh, we've been invited down to Second Brashane uh, by an air men's group to a men's breakfast on the 9th of March at 8 a.m. Um, if you want to go speak to Noel, oh, there's a list on the front here that you can sign up for. Cost is a tenner. Those are all the announcements. Let us turn again to worshipping God. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he did not sin. So let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let's stand and acknowledge that we have a great high priest as we come before the throne of God above. and 
I've been using this little book over the past few uh, weekends, uh, Sunday Matters by Paul David Tripp. It's a, like a weekly devotional to prepare our hearts and our minds for gathering for worship like this. Uh, and just last night as I was reading it, the little title, so to speak, is that corporate worship is designed to turn your fear into trust, your complaints into praise, and your independence into willing submission. Let us turn to God in prayer. Father, what tremendous words that we have just been singing. Lord, that hymn reminds us that uh, we do not go through life on our own, but if our trust is in Christ and Christ alone, then we have one who sits enthroned and high, one who has defeated all of our greatest fears, one who has overcome the grave and has ascended back to your right hand and has everything placed under his feet. We have an all-powerful saviour. We have a sovereign saviour. We have a gracious and merciful and loving saviour seated at your right hand. He has promised never to leave us nor forsake us, promised to be with us to the very end of the age, promised to be with us through his Holy Spirit, wherever we are each and every day and whatever situation we find ourselves in, Lord, whether it's good or whether it's bad, whether we're filled with confidence or whether fear overcomes us, we have before the throne of God a strong, a perfect plea, a mediator, who appeals to you on our behalf. And because of that, Lord, as we come to worship you, as we gather in this place and we lift our voices in praise, as we uh, seek you in prayer, as we, we read and meditate upon your word, listening for your voice, Lord, Father, may you encourage us. We all have our fears. Whether it's something very close to home that is causing us to to be filled with uncertainty and worry or whether it's looking at the global stage and all that's going on and we fear for the future. Father, we need to be reminded that you are God and you are in absolute control and nothing, nothing is a surprise to you. Everything is part of your good and perfect plan for the redemption of a people for yourself and the restoration of your creation. We fear because we do not trust in you. We do not lean upon you. We do not rest upon you. So Father God, come and open our eyes to see you in all your glory, in all your authority and see how you overcome all things. And for all who trust in you, we too can be victorious. Father, we come and seek your forgiveness for being complainers, complain moaners, for how we want everything to be done our way. How we want people to listen to us. How we want to be number one. Father, forgive us that life is, forgetting life is not about us, it's about you. You have called the people for yourself to live for your glory, to glorify God and to enjoy you forever. You've called us to be servants and your son showed us that example as we'll be thinking about in the coming Sunday evenings. He was a servant king who took on the lowliest of tasks and said that, that, that he set that example for us to follow. Forgive us, Lord. Who is man that you are mindful of him? We are specks of dust in all of your creation specs of us that have a unique opportunity to have a relationship with you and to serve you. Remind us of that, Lord. Forgive us for the striving to be independent, to be in absolute control of our lives, thinking we can do it all alone, that we don't need anyone else, that we will work hard and, and we will achieve all that we want in this life and we will work hard and achieve salvation for the next life forgive us lord forgive us for forgetting we are dependent upon you for our daily bread 
for a roof over our heads, clothes on our back, for family, for health, for strength, for everything. And above all, for salvation, as we were singing in our, that, ser- that praise before the service began, Lord, Lord, we are holy, holy, holy dependent upon you. We were walking in darkness. We could not see the light. We could do nothing to redeem ourselves. We are dependent upon you. And so, Lord, as we gather this morning, remind us of all those things. We have nothing to fear. The Father, we are not self-reliant. And rebuke us for our complaining and moaning. And help us to remember that we live for your glory. And you would seek to walk in your ways. Lord, we ask you to come. And be with us and move among us in Jesus' name. Amen. Children, want to come up to the front? Want to head? Fantastic, great to see you all here this morning. Missed you over the past uh, a few weeks when we had to be away, but it's great to be back with you this morning. And I've got a little story to share with you. It's going to come up on the screen. It's one of my the stories I love to tell from from the lost sheep, as it's called, the people who who make them, as you see up there. But tell me this before we start into your story. Tell me this: anybody know who these guys are? It's a very old picture. Anybody, Jacob? They are, yes, they are the army. Uh, they are soldiers, but they're, they were, they're very special soldiers. Anybody know? You probably don't. Any adults might be work it out? Sorry? I actually said that. Didn't know you were so smart, William. <laughs> <laughs> they're the ANSACs of the Australian New Zealand Army Corps. I think that's the way to put it. These were guys who fought away back in the war a long time ago, and they were an incredible bunch of guys. They were called the Diggers, D-I-G-G-E-R-S, and they were called this for, for, for a very particular reason. Let me explain. They, they, they always helped out a friend who was in need. Always. And in the war, and when people were fighting, people got injured and got hurt, and, 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 and the Diggers never left any of their friends who were injured, they always, always, always tried to bring them back. Instead, they never had a give up attitude. No matter how difficult things were, no matter how many barriers were in their way, uh, how, how, it was never easy, but that they never gave up. They were determined to do what they had to do. They were determined to fulfill the, the, the mission that they were commanded to do, or they were determined to make sure that no one was left behind in the war. They had a never give up attitude. They went through it about that. And thirdly, they didn't care what anybody else thought. Their friend was the most important thing to them. And so no matter what anybody else thought, whether they said, look here, lunatic, get back here, save yourself. No, their friend came first. They didn't care what anybody else said. We're going to listen to a little story from the Bible. And I'm wondering if you can find the diggers, the diggers who put their friends first, the diggers who never gave up, no matter how difficult, and the diggers who didn't care what anybody else said about them. Are you ready for your story? Here we go. Home, sweet home, said Jesus. Teaching and healing people is hard work. It's time to rest and relax with a banana milkshake. He had just sat down when knock, 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 someone was at the door. It was the next door neighbours. Jesus, welcome home. We'd like to know more about God. Can we ask you some questions? Sure, said Jesus. Come on in. Would you like a cup of tea, an orange juice, or a banana milkshake? Jesus served the drinks. Then started teaching. Knock, knock, knock. Someone else was at the door. Hello, Jesus. Jesus. We'd like to know more about God. Can we come in? Sure, said Jesus. Join the party. And Jesus served more drinks and kept on teaching. Knock, knock, knock. Good afternoon, sir. We are the Bible experts. May we please attend your Bible study? 
Of course, said Jesus, make yourself at home. And Jesus kept on teaching. Meanwhile, in a house nearby lived a man who could not walk. Knock, knock, knock. Someone was at the door. It was his four fantastic friends. Jesus is home, he yelled his friends. that it's healing time. They grabbed the bed and flew out the door. The Jesus house. Yes, it's healing time. But when they got to Jesus' house, the place was packed with people. Just carry me home, said the man who couldn't walk. I'll never get to see Jesus. Ha, said the four fantastic friends. We don't give up that easily. To the roof. And up they climbed. Through the roof and down they dug. Dig, dig, dig. Crash. And the four friends gently lowered the man to Jesus. Son, said Jesus, you have four fine faithful friends. Your sins are forgiven. The Bible experts glared at Jesus. They were both thinking the same thing. How dare Jesus say that? Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew that they were think, what they were thinking and said to them, Okay, experts, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up, grab your bed and go home. Amazing, yelled the crowd. Yes, yelled the friends. We told you it was healing time. And the man leapt up, grabbed his bed and ran home. So, did you spot the diggers? The friends, the four friends were the diggers because they knew their friend was was sick. He couldn't walk. Uh, He couldn't help himself. He needed someone else to help him. And the four friends were the diggers. Uh, And they went to get him when they knew Jesus was in town because they'd heard about Jesus. They'd heard about him being able to heal others. Uh, And so they got their friend and they went to the house. And so they were good friends. They didn't give up either, did they? When they went, the place was packed. They couldn't get near the door to get into Jesus. Uh, And nobody would let them in. They didn't care about the the man who couldn't walk. They just wanted to hear Jesus. It was all about them. But the four friends didn't give up. They went up to the roof. And they, in those days, the roofs were flat and made of clay and mud. and, And they dug through it. And they lowered their friend down to see Jesus. And they didn't care what anybody else said. They didn't care if people were shouting at them for making a big hole in the roof. They didn't care uh, what the people said when they were trying to push through the crowd. Their friend was the most important thing. And the most important thing for their friend was to see Jesus. Because they knew Jesus was his only hope. I wish we could be more like those four friends. I wish we could see people who were in need, no matter what that need was. I wish we had that didn't give up attitude that we say, well, there's a need and we must try and meet that need. We must help that person, whatever that help is, is that they need. And I wish we didn't care so much about what other people said if we were helping others and doing what Jesus wants us to do. But we like our comfortable lives and we do care about what others say about us. But there's nothing more important than bringing our friends to Jesus. That's their greatest need. You come here every week. Uh, you hear in Sunday school. You hear in the little talk that I give to you. And then when, when Children's Church starts back up, very soon by the looks of it, the hall's coming on great. Uh, you'll be hearing more about Jesus. But lots of your friends maybe don't go to church. Maybe don't go anywhere. Don't know about Jesus. Don't know what he did for them on the cross. Don't know what a friend he wants to be for them. And that's our job. That's your job. To know your friends to know what their need is, to never give up even if they don't want to listen about Jesus and don't care about what others say when you say, I believe that Jesus is God. He's my saviour and I trust him and I walk with him. He wants to be your friend. Will you be somebody else's friend? And will you take, take them to see Jesus and to hear what he has to say. Let's pray for a moment, and then we're going to sing a song together. Father, thank you for, for this story of those men who, who, who cared so deeply about their, their friend and his needs that they were prepared to do anything 
at any cost just to get him to your son, the Lord Jesus, who would heal him, from uh, make him walk again, and more importantly, forgive his sins. Father, thank you for their determination and for their love for their friend, and help us to be the same. Help us to be determined. Help us to love our friends, love our families, love those around us. Help us to see their needs, or maybe they are practical needs, but above all, the greatest need is to come to know Jesus as their friend and their savior and their Lord. Lord, help us to be brave and bold and courageous and take that stand. Lord, help us in the week ahead to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to sing the song we've been, we've been learning for a while now. And it, it reminds us that, yes, Jesus is God. Jesus is, is up in heaven. He's enthroned and, he, and, and he's all powerful. But he's also our friend. Our friend who came and didn't care what all the people thought about him. Didn't let anything get in his way of going to the cross to die for our sins and then rising again to give us the assurance of eternal life. I have a friend, a faithful friend. Let's stand and sing this lovely song.
Awesome, guys. You head back to your seats. Thank you. Great to see you. After we break last week, we return to our, our studies in the book of Acts. Uh, I hope you uh, were encouraged and blessed and challenged by... by uh, uh, Raymond's uh, work, working through the chapter 2 and so off uh, that book. We're going to look at chapter 3 now, our part, the opening section of chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 to 10. Um, this is where Peter and John uh, are used by God to heal the lame man. Let us hear the word of God together. Acts 3, beginning at verse 1. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Amen. And we thank God for his word. I mean, he blesses the reading of his eternal truth. Amen. Let's turn to prayer now as we come and bring our requests for others before our Lord. Father, again, we thank you for the privilege of prayer, uh, made possible because of your Son. And Lord, it is in his name we come, our, our, our mediator, our intercessor at your right hand. And we come in his name for his glory. And we bring our requests before you, Lord, for, for different situations. And Father, we start by looking further afield and it's hard to believe the news that we've been watching over the past couple of days that this Ukrainian conflict is entering into its third year. Many of us remember it very freshly when it started. And now it's, it's, it continues and no sign of an end. And Father, as we gaze upon the pictures and see the devastation, we just wonder where on earth do you start picking up the pieces? And what is the, the emotional cost? Not just the fact that buildings, cities, towns have been virtually wiped out, but lives, thousands of lives have been lost, families torn apart, grieving that, as, that their loved ones will never return home, maybe not even to be buried, Lord. But we can't imagine the pain that they're, they're going through. And then the news moves on to the Israeli and Gaza conflict and the devastation that is going there rumbles on, it rumbles on. No sense of compromise. No sense of regret at the loss of life. No sense of a desire, Father, for peace to be restored and neighbors to live together. And then on the news again, Yemen. Another earth strike by the UK and the US. Lord, in the midst of a conflict that has been going on for years and yet barely reaches the news only because our armed forces have gotten involved recently. More devastation, more bloodshed, more fear. Well, your son was given the name Prince of Peace. And Father, we ask that you would uh, Lord, send him, send the spirit to come and to transform these situations. Only you can do it. Only you can change the hearts of hard hearts of men who are intent on such evil, 
whose thirst and hunger for power takes priority over their compassion for their fellow man. Father, come and for your people in all of these situations, your church, small, that may be, we pray that they would shine bright in the darkness, reaching out hands of, and arms of love and of compassion, of, of, of care and, and, and comfort to those who are struggling, whether they're, whether they're seen as enemies or friends. But that your church, Lord, may stand out and Lord, many will come to know Christ as a result of their humility and their service. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters um, on this island, and particularly we think of the, the congregation down in, in Tullamore, where just over a week ago they had to the, the cancel their, their, their gathering because of a break-in and damage that was done to their meeting house. Father, we pray for them. We pray for the minister, William Hayes, and, and for the whole congregation, Lord, as they, they pick up the pieces, as they, they continue to meet there. We pray, Lord, that their resilience, their never-give-up attitude would be a, a tremendous testimony and witness to, to that uh, village, that town. We pray for those just over 30 families who are connected to it, Lord, that despite that break in the second one in the last year and a half or so, Lord, that you would come and encourage them. You would come and, and bless them and meet their needs. Lord, and help them to continue to be a faithful witness to those around them. And Lord, hopefully, we pray that as they have opened their doors this morning, that the neighborhood would come to offer support and encouragement and yet hear the gospel. Hear the reason for the hope that these people have and why they continue to meet and worship there. And Father, for our own congregation, Lord, thank you for the progress in the hall. It's exciting and it's getting near a conclusion. And, uh, and Lord, we'll soon be able to, to use it and, uh, and have other organizations and activities in the one place again and an and opportunity for new, new outreach into the community. Father, we pray for all our organizations as they are gradually coming to an end as spring approaches. We thank you for your faithfulness to them and all that they've been able to do in encouraging people and pointing them to Christ. And Father, we pray for tomorrow night for our congregational meeting as we come to discuss a few more wee changes in, in, in our property, Lord, that we come with a, a humble spirit, uh, willing to, to he learn what you want us to do, what your will is for us. And Father, that we would seek you in prayer. And we pray for those who are unwell at the minute, with, with folks we have in hospital, uh, undergoing treatment, recovering from, from surgery and treatment, Lord, and waiting for tests to see what's wrong. For those at home who are frail, those at home who, Lord, are just home to be cared for and to be made comfortable. We pray for them all that they would know your peace and your comfort. They would know you as Lord and Savior and not be fearful, but trust in you. And for strength for their families, those who are up and down the road to the hospital on a daily basis, or those who are carrying it home for good strength and for encouragement. And we offer ourselves to you, Lord, that when we leave this place, our, our worship will continue as we live lives that bring you glory. And that people we come into contact with in, the, with in the week that lies ahead will come to know you. They will see you shining bright through us, and they will want to learn more about who this great God is. And so, Lord, we offer all these things to you for your glory, for your honor, for the building of your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. We come to worship God with our offering. As we do that, we're going to sing this lovely of the old hymn, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, saith the Lord. Let's remain in their seats as our offering is selected and let us worship God with this lovely old hymn. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know the Savior 
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see Jesus. Father, as we turn to your word, indeed open the, the eyes of our heart that we would see your truth, see you, the great God that you are. Open our minds to grasp and understand that amazing truth. 
and open our hearts to receive it and to fall deeper in love with you, Lord, and to become more trusting in who you are. Come, O oh God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a great old hymn, isn't it? Isn't that a lovely hymn? It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Great words. Great words. But is it as simple as that? Just simply to trust in Jesus as a word. When you get up in the morning and you go out into the day ahead and whatever you may be facing, do you go out and just going to trust in Jesus' word no matter what comes? I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to be fearful. Or if you go out later on today or tomorrow morning and something happens, is your faith, is your trust in Jesus rocked? Is it shaken? Whether it's suffering and sickness or whether it's something else, maybe a family member or a friend who, 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 who lets you down in the most dramatic of ways. Maybe you've been praying for something and, and, and it doesn't happen the way you think it should or you desire it should. You think, God, are you really there? You promised so much, but... You know, we can be baffled as to why such things happen. If, if there is an all-loving uh, and an all-powerful and, and a gracious and a merciful God, what, why, why, is he not, why is he not hearing my cry? Why is he allowing this to happen? I suppose in relation to Acts 3, here was a man who had been lame from birth. Sickness. If there's anything that really rocks our faith, it is sickness. And, and, and this congregation has been through that in recent years. In particular, we have had a number of, of folks who have battled serious illness. And, and we just wonder, where is God? Why isn't he doing something? Sadly, sickness is part of life and will always be part of life this side of eternity. And, it, and, and, it, and it's all the result of, of sin. Adam and Eve. After Adam and Eve sinned, after they, they disobeyed God and took up the forbidden fruit, God said that sick, sickness and illness and troubles would come into the world. Leviticus 26, God gives a list of consequences for di disobeying his word, including wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and drain away your life. Now, we cannot and we should not say that that person is sick because they have done such and such a thing. You cannot always draw a direct link between illness and behavior. Just because someone is ill is not necessarily a result of personal sin, although that can happen. But sin or sickness is here, folks. We have a loving God. We have a faithful God. But illness and sickness and troubles are in this world because of sin, because of man's rebellion against him, and it is the consequence of that. Now, I am not going to answer or try to answer is why do some people get sick and why do others not, um, because I can't. And I can't because the Bible doesn't tell us. Bible doesn't tell us why bad things seem to happen to good people and not to those who we deem as the renegades of society. And as we turn to passages like this, we trust in the promises of God, we trust in his word, and we see stories like this, and, 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 and we think, well, God did it then. I mean, why did, that, why did he heal that guy? I mean, what did he deserve? Or what did he do that God should heal him? And, and he's not doing it now. Why? Yeah, maybe it does cause us to doubt the scriptures. Are these really, these real events, did they really happen or is it just made up to try and encourage us or to, to con us into trusting in a non-existent God? Acts was written by Luke, who wrote the gospel, and Luke was a, a medical doctor. Luke was a medical doctor, and, and when you read his, his, his material, you see when it comes to dealing with uh, instances where people were ill or sick, he's very detailed, and that's because of his, of his medical background, and it's no different here. He's very detailed in all he says. We read, Peter and John were going to the temple for the time of prayer, which was their, their practice, afternoon prayer, and as they went through uh, the gate called Beautiful, which was, again, very accurate, 
uh, uh, name and place, they came across a man who had been crippled by birth. And if we were to flip over to uh, chapter 4, we would say that the man was over 40 years of age. So he knew nothing else. And see, uh, as the apostles passed by, as was the practice in those days, families would leave their, their, their ill uh, relatives at the, at the gates. He, he cried out, asking for alms, asking for money. Somehow, it's the only way he could receive money. No disability benefits in those days. Trusting in the, the, the charity of others to put food on his table. And he got an answer that he didn't expect. Peter looked at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And this is what happened in verse 6. Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And in the next couple of verses we read, and he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk. This was indeed a miracle. People knew this man. They knew it wasn't a con artist. They knew he had been, he'd been lame from birth. They knew he was genuinely in need and, and, and nobody had been able to help him. And this was truly a, a, a miracle. But so, so why doesn't it happen now? If God's the same yesterday, today and forever, well, why does he not do the same thing now? The problem is, we fail to see, or we can fail to see the whole picture. If you went through the, the, the Acts of the Apostles, and actually even if you went through the Gospels, you would see that God didn't heal everyone who came before them. They healed many, but not everybody was healed. And so if you go through the Acts of the Apostles in particular, you will see that the stories of healing were amongst unbelievers. Those who, who didn't trust in Christ, who didn't know who Jesus was. And those healings were rare events. They weren't in the majority. They were rare events. And it was used to, 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 to prove something about God. If you look at other parts of the New Testament, you will see that those who were followers of Jesus, those who worshipped him, were not necessarily healed. Paul Three times he asked for the thorn in the flesh to be removed and God didn't do it. Timothy had a problem with his stomach and it was never cured. Trophimus, Epaphroditus, other followers of Jesus who had illnesses were not healed of those illnesses. So just because you're a, you trust in Christ, we see from the scriptures, God's word, that it does not guarantee that we will enjoy perfect health this side of eternity. Now before I go on to, to speak of some lessons from this, I want to, make sure, want to make clear that I'm not avoiding the answer, okay, to this difficult question. Why? Why not? Um, why are some healed? Why are others not healed? Why do some get sick? Why do others not get sick? I don't know. You know we have been through uh, uh, you know, challenging times in our past and, and we don't know why. But we trust in a and a faithful God whose purposes are perfect. But here are a couple of lessons that I want us to take from, from this passage, uh, really relate to, to every healing that we read about, or every miracle we heal about in, in the scriptures. And I hope that these couple of lessons will be of an encouragement to us all, that will, that will strengthen our faith in God, even though we don't understand why he does what he does but we will come to trust him more and more. If we were to turn to the, the end of John chapter 20, and this has been in my head because we've been going into the school and doing Amazing Jesus, and this is uh, the basis of what we're doing. But at the end of John's gospel, he said this, these are written, so words, everything that John recorded in his gospel and the miracles and teachings of Jesus, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. You see, when Jesus performed miracles, and then when his apostles performed miracles, they were, they were performed to, to point to the identity of who Jesus is and the validity of his teachings. And this is what Jesus said right at the beginning of his ministry in Mark chapter 2. That was just that story I shared earlier with the kids. 
Listen, we, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. The friends brought him so that he would walk again, but Jesus started off by saying, Your sins are forgiven. And of course, the religious leaders, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all that, were not impressed at all. Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus, to prove who he was, to prove his divine nature, said, which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. See, Jesus did heal out of compassion. Jesus doesn't want to see us ill or, 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 or struggling in any way because that's not part of the plan of creation. That is a result of sin, so he has compassion. But healings were done ultimately to prove who he was, the Son of God, in fact, God himself. These miracles were done to perform that, that he was God who had become flesh and made his dwelling amongst us, as we read in the beginning of John. Miracles were there to prove he, his divine nature, that he is God. And from this passage, uh, and from all the miracles actually, we also see that, that miracles are a display of the divine power of God Almighty. They are a direct act from God. They are not a cure through any other means except God directly intervening in a person's life. Notice here, when Peter spoke to this man, he did not simply say, get up and walk. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Peter was the, the vessel through whom God brought healing. But Peter did not have the power. Peter was, didn't have some sort of magical power or special gift where he could heal. It was in the name of Jesus. It was the power of the God Almighty working through his servant to bring healing. And that's what Peter was doing. He was pointing to that fact. Little devotions I use are called Table Talk, and it said this. It's funny, it said it's going through the book of Acts. But it says this, the fact that the miracles of the apostles in Christ are so similar is no accident. For the apostles were instruments through whom Christ worked. Thus we see that the acts of the apostles are really the acts of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, friends, no one who claims to have the power to cure us or cure anybody is being honest. Not a doctor. Not someone who claims to have healing powers. No one can claim to heal anybody because only God can do it. For only God has the power. And Peter was showing that. And all the miracles recorded in here show that God has power over illness and everything else. Now sometimes, and frequently he does work through what we call ordinary means, through doctors, through medical people and so on. Because he's given them the, the knowledge and the skill uh, and the ability to, to treat us, whether it's through medicine or surgery or whatever else. Sometimes he does work in an unexplainable way. People are cured and doctors are baffled and all the rest of it. But it's God who does the healing. God who does the restoring, whether it's through ordinary means or whether it's through a miraculous act of in his Holy Spirit. And it's only in the name of Jesus that we find power. And it's in the name of Jesus when we plead for God's healing upon someone that we must come. It's not our pleading that does it, but it's when we come in the name of Jesus and call upon that power. Healings were done, or miracles were done to prove the identity of Jesus. They were a display of divine power. Uh, and they were also a sign that Jesus had come to usher in uh, God's kingdom. The prophet Isaiah spoke of, of what the Messiah would do when he came. He said, the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the the ears of the deaf unstopped, then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Listen to what, what one person says about this prophecy and, and this miracle in, in, in Acts 3. Isaiah's prophecy is a picture of Eden restored to its pre-fallen beauty. 
The coming of Jesus Christ ushers in the beginning of a process that following his return at the end of the age will accomplish the complete fulfillment of this prophecy. Jesus, the last Adam, came to restore the world from its current state of disintegration and sin to its former state of beauty and glory. The healing of the cripple is a sign of what one day will be manifested in all its splendor. See, friends, the healing of this crippled man in Acts 3 and and all the other miracles that that Jesus performed are are to give us a glimpse into what awaits those who trust in him. They are signs of, of how things will be recreated upon Christ's return, the way God intended them to be perfect. No sickness, no illness, no frailty, no sorrow. They are a sign for what is to come. But they're also a sign for something else. They're a sign of a greater illness that we need to be cured from. As you said, the start sickness is a symptom of a deeper problem. It's a, it's a symptom of our rebellion, our sin against God. And while Jesus came to, to heal uh, the physical sicknesses and weaknesses of people, out of compassion, it was to point to our greater need. The spiritual disease that is wrecking our lives and leading us to destruction. Thomas Aquinas, sin is a spiritual illness. Thus sinners are in need of salvation. This lame man couldn't do anything for himself. He, he had been like this from birth. He was over 40 years of age. There was nothing medically could be done for him. He was helpless. Ephesians 2 tells us that we are born dead in transgressions and sins and we are incapable of doing anything about it. We cannot cure ourselves of this illness. It is destroying our lives. It is taking us to a lost eternity without Christ. For the lame man, he couldn't help himself, neither can we. The lame man needed someone else to cure him. Someone else who had the power to help him and to, uh, and, and to heal his legs and give him the ability to walk again. And likewise, friends, each and every one of us needs someone, someone else who has the power to heal us from sin. Someone else who has the power to breathe new life into us and raise our dead spirits to life once again. And that power is the same power that healed this lame man. And that power is found in the name of Jesus and Jesus alone. The man couldn't, couldn't boast that, that he fixed himself. He did, couldn't boast that it was Peter who healed him. We hear that, hear that he went walking and leaping and praising who? God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. He made it abundantly clear who had healed him. He gave glory to God. And he let everybody know it. And friends, we need to be like this. We need to realize that our salvation is not of us. Our salvation is not of any preacher that we have heard. Because that preacher was simply the instrument through whom God worked. Our salvation is all of God. Paul said later on in Ephesians 2, it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Our salvation is all of God and we should declare it loudly as this man did back in Acts 3. Friends, we... We all suffer illness, so we know people who have suffered illness, some more serious than others, and we pray for them, and rightly so. And God can, and he still does, heal people. Though we don't understand who he heals and why he heals some and not others. And that is, is beyond human comprehension. That is all part of the perfect will of God. But the reality is, while we pray passionately for, for people's healing, and nothing wrong with it, If God does heal him, it's only a temporary thing anyway. 
because these physical bodies will not last forever. And the older they get, the more you realize that when parts start to wear, wear out and creak and groan and crack when they shouldn't be making noises like that. So friends, it's more important that we recognize the most serious illness that we all suffer from. That we recognize our deep spiritual need. And that we recognize that there's only one who has the power to heal us from it. There's only one who has the power to restore us to the way God intends us to be. And that is in the name of Jesus. He is only one who can bring us forgiveness and salvation and eternal healing. You know, God can do great things. Nothing is impossible for him. He may give us physical healing. He may uh, lift our burdens. He can and will bring salvation to those who call upon the name of Christ. But, as our closing song says, when Christ, when Jesus comes to reign, restoring everything, our tears will turn to tides of praises to our King. We'll behold the glory of our King forever, Christ our Savior. Life will be different when Christ our life appears. Let's stand and praise him.
Now may the God who never abandons you and never lets go of you go before you in your darkness, stand beside you in your fears, make you faithful in your temptations until Jesus comes. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.